I want to welcome you back to again this Sunday. This is uh, Sunday, June. My gracious, June's already here. The 7th. If you think I'm still wearing the same clothes I wore last Sunday, well, you're right, because we're taping both of these. This is actually May the 31st, and um, because our uh, technical pastor, Chuck Reese, is leaving town. He's running off and taking all this stuff. But uh, we're blessed to be a part of this. You know, I hope you noticed last week in the message that uh, it was crystal clear. I hope it was for you. You know, ever since we've started doing this, uh, we've been tested time and time again. The enemy just trying to distract us and get us off focus and with technical difficulties. And But my man, my brother Chuck has uh, got the stuff working now. And we're so blessed and honored uh, to to be in this room and to be a part of this. We've come to um, Luke chapter 5 again. This is actually part 2 about the leper who's being healed. Last week we were looking at how we care about people and you know what our heart has to be long before we ever get them to a place of salvation and or, or to get them to a place where they would even consider Jesus. They've got to see Jesus and that's what happens in this leper's life. Uh, that he is so transformed. And this leprosy, you know, we talked about the modern day name for that now it is Hansen's disease. And leprosy has not gone away. Uh, there are medications that help people have a better quality of life. and those. But there are untold thousands of people around the world. Uh, some, there are still leper colonies where people live. But uh, with, because they can't get a lot of the medicines and the help that they desperately need. But uh, so leprosy, we said last week, is like a, it, it's like a sin in the Bible that, uh, that it causes people to uh, just be undesirable in the kingdom of God. That, that's what sin does. Uh, we were created in the image of God, and God is love. And if we're not loving, there's something wrong with our walking towards God and with God in a way that changes us. The Word of God ought to be changing us. And so that's why I hope you're reading your Bibles more. And, uh, if, and if you're not, you know, we've been, a lot of people have been on lockdown who said, oh, years ago, you know, I, I just don't have time to read the Bible. Well, boy, a lot of people have had time over the past couple of months or more. And uh, I hope you've been taking advantage of that. I believe God's church is learning something. And I think there's so much more uh, that's about to be revealed. And uh, certainly, I, 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 am, I am overwhelmed to think that we would never thought we would have videos like this going out. And some of the words that I'm getting back from people, the encouraging things um, from all the way down in Lafette, Georgia, and uh, that lady knows who she is. And I appreciate so much uh, just the encouragement that they've been and uh, in letting us know how God's blessing them and others around them. But, uh, but I hope and pray, whether we hear from you or not, that's not even the point. I don't need to be patted on the back. Uh, I, it, I, I just want Jesus to be known in your life so that he can be seen through your life. This leper... Uh, you know, the, the, this leprosy attacks the nerves and uh, it causes uh, people to not even be able to feel pain. And, uh, you know, and they can be being burned or things happening to them and, and it's breaking down the tissue and, and, and it's causing even finally such decay that one little digit at a time begins to come off until there's no fingers or there's no toes or and then feet are gone and and so on and so forth until finally the ultimate thing is that they find themselves dead. That all of this, if you look at it as sin, ultimately leads to death because the wages of sin, Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. And so uh, that's what leprosy uh, becomes. And so leprosy as, as sin... It causes a person, if we look at it as sin, leprosy is deeper than just skin deep. It's not just something surface that we can deal with ourselves. It's something that somebody who knows how to operate, somebody who knows how to take care of and inject 
something or whatever the case may be. And when you look at that in, in light of being sin, Jesus is the only. He's the great physician, not just for the physical body, but He's the great physician that heals the hurts and the sin of our life. And He takes that and He transforms that. And so this leprosy it is a sin that it, it, it more than skin deep. And it spreads fast and defiles uh, it's kind of like, you know, the, the Bible talking about leaven in the Old Testament being like sin at times and, and during the Passover and other uh, feast days that they would get all the leaven out of the house and because a little leaven, the Bible says, leavens the whole loaf. And so that's what sin does in our life. And so it's more than skin deep and, and it uh, spreads so rapidly and because it defiles, we're separated outside the camp. And every person that has sin that is sin, every person who's not dealt with sin, needs to see themselves in light of this man's story of leprosy and that he's outside the camp and he's separated uh, from, from uh, life, his old li or life and love. And, and ultimately, because sin leads to death, ultimately people who don't deal with sin, they find themselves separated forever from God. One day separation in hell. Boy, you don't hear that word very much anymore, do you? But it's still a reality. The Bible says that every day, every day hell hath enlarged itself. And so we need to understand that how critical and serious uh, these things are with God. Sin, an old saying I heard some time ago, that sin takes you farther than you ever intended to go. And sin costs you more than you ever intended to pay. And the thing about that debt of sin is we can't pay it. Jesus paid the price for us at Calvary. And we thank God for that. But what I like about this today, and let, let's read verse 12. It said, and it happened when he was in a certain city that behold, a man who was full of leprosy. This was not a, a new disease for him. That, that his entire body was just filled with leprosy. And he saw Jesus and he fell on his face and implored him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. One thing I love about this leper, this man is, is a man that Jesus really can help. You see, Jesus can't help anybody that doesn't understand they need help. We've got to come to a place. If you think uh, you're still the master of your fate and your ship and you know the captain of your ship and, and that, that you're ruling your life, you're going to come to an abrupt end someday. Everyone without Jesus does. And this, but this leper, he, he knew that he needed help. He needed change. And he, the good part is that, that he wanted this change. <laughs> he, and it, so he comes to the source, the only source that can make this change for him. There was no cure in that day. There, there was no being declared clean by any priest anywhere but at any time. And so here this leper had no hope. No hope. And the world without Christ has no hope. That's why... People without Jesus needs to get a glimpse of Jesus. This leper, he, he saw Jesus. And I don't believe that people get saved until they see Jesus. And that's why the body of Christ, followers of Christ, we need to see the call of God and the purpose He has left us here in this world is that when people look at our lives, imperfect as we are, every now and then, I mean, if you hang around me all day long, I hope and pray, at some point you just get a little glimpse of Jesus. Because if you get that glimpse, and it's a real glimpse of the real Christ, His love and His ways and His caring and His holiness and His righteousness, and one day His judgment is coming, you get a glimpse of the real Jesus not a Mormon Jesus, not, not even a Baptist Jesus. I'm talking about Jesus from the Word of God. When we get a glimpse of Him, we begin to see how 
hopeless we are without Him, that I'm in my sins and I need Him as my Savior. And the good part was this leper knew he needed change and, and he knew and understood he wanted to be changed. Some people know they need to change, but they don't want anything any different. Some people think they're okay. Maybe they're good moral people and it's hard to get folks to understand. And maybe their lives are, you know, maybe they're wealthy and they just don't need anything. That's why Jesus said that it was hard for a rich man, almost impossible for a rich man to come into the kingdom of God. That is a rich man whose God is his money. And that causes them to not know Oh, they, they, they know they're not perfect people, but they don't know they need Jesus. Well, this man knew and he got a glimpse of Jesus. God help us today that we understand there are people all around us. It may be a family member. It may be a spouse or uh, your parents or, or your children at your feet or your neighbor or your co-worker or your best friend. And if you're a believer and you're kind of keeping that hid, how will they ever find Jesus? Oh, they know something's different about your life. Oh, they see some changes and you know this and that. But, but God said we were to go into all the world and make disciples. And that means there's an intentionality at sharing. And He said that these people that you're giving the message to, that as they're being coming to Christ and being baptized, He told the disciples in Matthew 28, He said, at the end there, He said, teaching those people that you're dealing with to be obedient to everything that I've commanded you. You see, that's why we need to be vocal. To be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within us. The world has no hope like this man had no hope. But you see, he had already seen some things, no doubt, out of Jesus. Jesus had already done miracle after miracle and he had either seen that happen or he had heard the story already because it caused him to come to Jesus and to fall on his face and to say, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Now, in verse number 13, I love, and we talked about last week, and it just it, it stirred my heart uh, even on Friday and Saturday before last Sunday and and. I, I just was so excited. I couldn't wait to, to share because, folks, we're not here just to be hard-nosed, give them the Word of God and that's it and not care. We have to spend time. Jesus entered into our world. That's why we know Him today. And I wonder whose world are we entering into? I don't mean just your family. We need to enter into those worlds and make sure those things, right things are happening. But there are people around you like we talked about last week that perhaps are undesirable and people you wouldn't normally spend time with or even give time to. But they're in your life for a reason. I, I believe God's sovereign and, and He's in control of all things. And the people that you have in your life, people that maybe right now you're having a hard time with, people that uh, are giving you grief, people that are hard to work with, maybe it's at work or maybe at church or in your neighborhood, uh, a neighbor that is just, mm, you're having a hard time. Jesus has put you, put that person in your life, put you in their lives for a reason. And... They need you because Christ is in you as much as you need them because people that we have difficulties with, Jesus gives us everything we need to know how to love them. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to change. I mean, that's, a, that's between God and, and the person. That's the Holy Spirit's business to change lives. But we've got to give the gospel. That's like casting those nets that Jesus talked about a couple of weeks ago with Simon and James and John. The gospel net, we need to cast it. We need to sow the seeds of the Word of God. But we need to do it in love. Not despising, not just hateful, not just, oh, if you don't accept Jesus, you're going to hell. No. It's that we're really caring about the people 
And that's what we find in verse 13. Then Jesus, He put out His hand and touched him. Last week we said this went against the law. The law said don't touch them. If you do, then you'll be unclean if you touch a leper. But see, Jesus was the only perfect man who ever lived. He's the sinless God-man. Fully man and fully God. I don't understand all that, but I believe it because the Word of God says so. And He was the only one that could touch an unclean and not become unclean, except that ultimately He became unclean for this man. He became unclean. That He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we could know the righteousness of God. And this is what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says. That He became sin. And so we know that when Jesus touched this man. It didn't defile him. But I know in the heart and mind of Jesus, He knew that just in a few days, He'd be going to a cross for this leprous man. For those who needed Him. For you. (laughs) And for me. Jesus knew that He would become sin for us. And we, that's why we don't have to die in our sin. And we thank God for that today. But Jesus put out His hand and He touched him. And He said, I'm willing. What an, what an awesome thing to say. There, when, you, when you look at the words of Jesus, and maybe you've got a red letter edition of the Bible, I encourage you just kind of flip through the New Testament there and and look at all those red letters and people have done studies on just the red letters of the Bible. Now all of it's important. It's all the Word of God. But there's times Jesus says things that it's hard for us to comprehend. It's hard for us to understand. It's hard for us to even at times agree with. But um, there's Jesus is right. Whatever it is you feel. The things that Jesus says. You see, He said, teach people to be obedient to everything that I've commanded you. If we don't know what He's commanded, how can we teach people? That's why the Word of God is so vitally important for us. And what we need to understand is this. Our part in this is to represent Jesus. And to live in a way that honors God. To be, to be a vessel of honor for the glory of God. The Holy Spirit of God lives in you if you're truly a follower of Christ. And the Holy Spirit, you see, if we sin and keep sinning and after we've prayed a prayer and got dunked in a pool somewhere or something, and, but life is still just all about us and we never think about the things of God. Wow. Wow. I have to wonder and ask, where's the Holy Spirit? Because He came into this world to convict the world of sin. And He keeps doing, bringing that conviction into our... He don't stop because He moves into us. Because there's a changing that continuously takes place on this journey to seeing God someday that we're laying aside the sin and the weight of sin that so easily besets us. And so, and why do we do that? Because we're smart and good and figured it out? (laughs) No. Not at all. We do that because God loves us so much. Do you know, God loves you just like you are. (laughs) But He loves you too much to leave you like you are. And so for that person that's a church attending person and religious and got it all figured out and life is just about you and you couldn't find your Bible with a search warrant. Being with other God, of God's people is not important to you at all. You know, I often wonder why people say they love God and they're going to heaven, but they never want to be around God's people. Don't they know that's all that's going to be in heaven? <laughs> why would you want to spend eternity with me if you don't want to spend an hour or so a week in a place of worship? See, God puts that in. That's not the main thing, but that's part of the Christian life. 
And there are those habits of our life that God develops like prayer and reading the Word and caring and giving and attending, being with other believers. Those are the traits of a true child of God. And you, you may struggle with sin, and, 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 but, but there's that Holy Spirit of God that is drawing us to give ourselves back to God if we're walking away from Him. I know. I've, spent, I've been stuck on stupid in my life. But I was the most miserable person for all the time. And every time I start leaning on my own understanding, I find myself that way again. But it's not a harsh condemnation. If, you, if you're feeling condemned, it's not coming from God. It's coming from the enemy. God may bring conviction, but He doesn't bring condemnation. Romans 8.1, I think it is, said, There's now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There's the question. Are you in Christ Jesus? Are you like this leper? And you cry out to God, God be merciful to me a sinner. I know if you're willing, you can change me. And before God changes you, He has an agent of His love in this world that ought to be reaching out and touching you with care and concern. Overlooking your harshness perhaps, overlooking... And just praying, saying, thank you, God, you've brought this person into my life for a reason. And I know you want me to love them. And I can only do that with your help. Look, I've not always done that the way I should. I've failed miserably on many occasions. I'd love to go back and spend time with my kids as they were little because I was too distracted with churchy stuff sometimes. Oh, I was with them and went to the ball game. Although, but I missed discipling my children. What God was pouring into me, I was becoming more like the Dead Sea. The fresh, live water was coming in. But there was a lot that wasn't going out to my kids like they should have. And I'm so blessed that my daughter and my son love God now that they're seeking to raise their children and hopefully doing a better job than I did. But you see, God's the only one that can change us. And He wants to use you to reach out and love and care for someone that maybe the whole world despises. That person at work, nobody wants to work with them. <laughs> if you know Jesus, don't be surprised that before you go in, the next time you go back to work, <laughs> that you find yourself saying, you know, I think I can work with that guy today. God will put that in your heart because that person, they just need Jesus. And the church needs to see people fully committed to Christ. Before I came here this morning, my wife prayed over me and she, and she read Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. <laughs> now she stopped there reading that to me. She said, I know you've heard it a hundred times. I said, baby, I need to hear it again. But it's your reasonable act of worship. And it goes on though to say, and be not conformed to this world. You see, if we hate, despise, and reject and build walls between us and other people and we don't like them because they're not like us, and my question becomes, where is the Spirit of Christ in that kind of attitude in life? And you see, Though I am not fully like Jesus, Romans 8.29 says that God is working in me, in you, if you know Him. That He's molding and shaping us to the image of, guess who? <laughs> His Son, Jesus. That's God's plan. Are you 
running with God's plan or running away from God's plan? Are you running with God's plan or running against God's plan? Could I encourage you to examine yourself to see if you even be in the faith or not? Why would we not want to why would we not want to be obedient to the one who saved us from death, eternal death? And to understand we belong to him and our life is his. And he wants to use whatever you do for a living, whatever hobby you have, your hobbies, your, 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 what you do for a living, things going on in the neighborhood. He wants you to use those things as tools and places and times and ways and atmospheres where you can just show people what would Jesus do if this came up or that happened. That because they won't get a glimpse of Jesus unless perhaps they get a glimpse of Him in you. So may I encourage you. Jesus put out His hand and touched Him and said, Hey, I'm willing. Be cleansed. And immediately. Aren't you glad that we don't have to work hard to be saved? Aren't you glad that we don't have to save ourselves? And No. Jesus touches us. He speaks His Word. And the Holy Spirit of God cleanses us. The blood of Jesus washes away our sins. And we are acceptable in His sight. And He clothes us in His righteousness. The very best I can do on my own is this filthy rags in the sight of God. That's why I tell people, if you ever, if you ever see anything good out of me, just chalk it up to Jesus. Because only He can change a life. Anyway, in verse 14, the Bible says here in Jesus, He charged him to tell no one. Here, Man, here's this man who's had leprosy for a long time because he was full of leprosy. And, and Jesus said, okay, I've healed you, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> kind of strange, isn't it, that Jesus would do that. He said, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. I ran across something yesterday and I didn't get a chance to read it out thoroughly and to search it out, but my wife had shown me something where somebody in a writing had said that what was required, and when you go to, I think, what is Leviticus 13 and 14 along in there, you'll find a whole host of things for a leprous person and what they had to do to be pronounced clean and the sacrifices made and all that. And, and the person made the comment, I'm going to search it out and if this is not true, I'm sorry, I'm even wasting your time with it. But, but they said, did you know that what was required for a leper was the same sacrifices and same things to do that was required for a priest? I don't know what that does to you. But what I immediately thought about was this. That God's no respecter of person. There's no big I and little you in the kingdom of God. And when God looks at us, and whether you be that leper just coming to Him, or whether you be the priest, He said, I'm requiring the same from both of you. And I believe with all my heart what perhaps if that's true, and I've got to search it out, when I began to look at that, I believe with all my heart what God was saying that there's a connection, there's a link between you, undesirable, and the priests, the priesthood of all believers, the Bible says. That there's a link and He doesn't look at us any differently. Because, and, and here's the reason why. You see, when God looks at you and me, He doesn't see the faults and failures that we see every day when we look in the mirror. He don't see what we see. Sometimes we think we just want to give up. But you know God chose you. <laughs> when He chose you, and when He chose me, He knew every wart, He knew every failure, He knew every stumbling, He knew every sin. But He still chose you. That's how much He loves you. That's how much He loves me. And I believe with all my heart, one day we're going to find out that when He, when he looked at the leper, He saw the priest. 
that he was becoming. He saw the change. He saw the finished. When God looks at us, he sees the finished product. When he looks at you, he sees the finished product. You and I have to deal with what needs to be changed still. But you see, God gave us a, the Word of God and James said it's like a mirror. And we look in that. You know, sometimes you can take a mirror. I can take it and I can turn it this way. And if I had one, and I could see Chuck over there behind these cameras. <laughs> but the Word of God's not to look into to see the faults of someone else. James said we're going to look in this mirror and we're going to see ourselves. And... How foolish it would be to be that man that sees the changes in the morning looking in the mirror that need to be changed and we just walk away and not change them. Wow, we comb our hair, we brush our teeth, we wash our face, we get everything, ladies, you get that makeup on, you want to be just right as you walk out. How much more? Nothing wrong with those things, but how much more important is that which is eternal and changes becomes a part of changing people's lives. Well, he charged him not to tell anybody, and there's some things I could say there, but I want to move on. Verse 15, it says, however, the report went out. He didn't keep it quiet. Around, It went around concerning Jesus all the more. And great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. You know, as you read later, Maybe one of the reasons Jesus said, don't tell anybody at this moment, just go to the priest, be declared clean, was because this very thing would happen. The multitudes came. Because what you're going to read on in, in some verses to come, Jesus had to leave that area. And maybe it was because the leper couldn't keep it quiet. But can you imagine being a leper, shunned by everyone, not accepted, lonely, hurting, dying, no hope. But then you look up one day and there's Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Oh, you of little faith, look, Jesus wasn't scolding those men. He was just declaring, you've got faith. It may be a little, but you've got faith. And isn't it just the faith the size of a mustard seed that can move mountains? Wow. How little is that? And so understand today, God's not condemning you, but He's asking you, come follow me. I've got a life for you to live. And so this man, he couldn't keep it quiet. He was ready to give an answer for the hope that lied within him now. His life was changed. And, that, and so it is with every child of God. And if we don't see it that way and can't see it that way, something's wrong. Please, ask God about that. Father, why do I not see the changes? Why do I not feel the strength? And why am I not experiencing the joy and the peace you promised for your children? That's a legitimate question this morning. And so, people came to Him to be healed. You see, when we go out having been changed by the power of God's love and grace and mercy, forgiven of our sins and His Holy Spirit lives within us. We've got a story to tell. And people who used to know you before you came, to, saw Jesus, came to Him, they see changes. They see, even if you're not being vocal, they see some differences in your life. But how much more necessary is it for them that, that you ask God to help you walk with Him in all faithfulness, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that comes only through the Word of God. And so, believer, your life is different. If it's not, then maybe you're a make-believer. There's unbelievers, believers, and make-believers. And though you may be struggling, if it's bothering you, Chances are you're a believer because we're not that good to be struggling with sin. It's the Holy Spirit living within that causes us to consider our ways. The last verse here in verse 16 says, and we draw this to a close, so he himself, 
Jesus Himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. You know, He had to get away from the crowds. He was 100% man. He got tired. He got hungry. He hurt. He ached, I believe. And was weary at times, physically. The throng of the multitudes coming. And so He found Himself not being able to physically withstand. But the awesome thing, it's not just the physical refreshment, though that is part of it. And if you're not finding that, if you're, work, if you're a workaholic, I'm telling you, brother, you're not honoring God. Oh, I, I didn't say that you shouldn't be a go-getter and you know, but in that, there's a way to do all you need to do but to do everything that we do to the glory of God. That's 1 Corinthians 10, 31, I believe, along in there. But there's something about Jesus here I want to close with, and that's this. You know, if Jesus found it necessary to get away into the wilderness and to pray, who in the world do I think I am that I don't need that? Now that can happen in different ways. You could be have a closet. You could have a back porch. You could have a favorite chair. You could have a place to go up on a mountain somewhere and sit on a rock. I've done that. I miss Lookout Mountain in Chattanooga, Tennessee because <laughs> I had a rock there where I used to go. And You know, it dawned on me this morning, I've not found that place here in Farmington or in New Mexico yet. Will you pray for me that I find that place? Oh, it's not about the place, but you see, to find that place is a willingness to say, you know what, I don't need the phone, I don't need the TV, I don't need the internet, I don't need to be around people. I need to be alone with God. There's a book I saw the title of, not read it, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Well, you know what, Jesus was the most effective person that ever lived on planet Earth. He's our example of living. And I believe with all my heart we need to see at least three habits here that Jesus had in Luke already. We learned right quick that one of his habits his whole life from a child was that he went to the temple on the Sabbath. He found himself with other God of God's people. And come Sundays when you're able to go back to churches and in your area, will you find yourself there? I hope you do. God's kids will. They won't forsake the assembling of themselves together. In Romans 10, I believe it is. That, but you go up above that and it says that we come together for a reason, not just to get together and say, okay, I checked this box and now I've done it this week. God can't be too mad at me. No. It talks about the fact that we're to spur one another on, to provoke one another in some translations. That we're supposed to provoke one another to love and to good works. That's what the church looks like. I don't know what you're doing in those buildings where you're going to meet. And I'm not real sure much of what I've done in my life in buildings is that. But that's what he said is the main focus when we come together. And to provoke one that we become intentional about praying for one another and talking to one another and brainstorming with one another and talking to God together because there is something when we wake up, church, there's something God wants us to see. And it's a lost world that's undesirable and will spend eternity in hell until they get a glimpse of Jesus. So Jesus went to the temple. He went in today's vernacular. He went to church on Sunday. But you know the other things that he did? He spent time. Oftentimes you find him with food and he would give God thanks. I'm not saying we have to become legalistic about saying the blessing. Listen, no. There's times I sit down and I eat and I'm into eating and I finish eating and I'm like, you know what, Lord, I didn't thank you before, but I thank you now. God's not that legalistic with us that he shames us I've heard people shame people oh you didn't say the blessing but no it's not about that it's a relationship that causes us to come back and remember it's God that has provided my daily bread I don't care how hard I work to pay for it 
But God gave me the strength and the job and the mind and the wherewithal and the opportunity to do the work that we do. We do all we do to the glory of God. And the last thing is this. He often withdrew to a private place, the wilderness, up on a mountain somewhere, wherever. He got away from people and things so that he could spend time with his Father. Could I encourage you? Do you have a favorite place? Do you have a special place you go? Pray for me because I've not found one yet. Pray that I find one. I look forward to telling you soon. Maybe showing you a picture of that place. But do you have a place? It may not be on a mountain, but it could be in a closet. It could be on a back porch. It could be in a favorite chair. But turn everything off and turn your attention to the Father. That's what He desires. Jesus, our example, was all this. And this should be our aspiration that we're seeking to be more like Him. With His help, we can be that, not on our own. Don't try legalistically under your own strength because you'll quit. But when the Holy Spirit's leading, you may stumble at times, but you won't quit. Heavenly Father, thank You. Bless those who've heard this message today. Thank You that the leper saw Jesus. God, may somebody see Jesus in us even this day and they can be transformed by You, Your love, Your Word, Your power, Your Holy Spirit. Thank You for loving us. Call people to Yourself and use us as your messengers in Jesus' name. Amen.